And now, does anybody mention Gruden or the emails or any of that? I mean, it's ancient history, right? Do you think Patrick Mahomes tanked and fixed and threw that game against the Bengals? So I think fans will basically fall for it. Do you think the whole media is trying to make Antonio Brown look crazy? I think Antonio Brown is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Part one of my interview with Brian Tui can be found right here. The link is in the description. This is part two. It's after the season, recapping what happened. But hey, be sure to check out Brian Tui of thefixesin.net. Check out his work. He has several books on the NFL and several other sports. And the link is also in the description below. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Last time we spoke, we, we covered a range of topics. One thing in particular that we talked about was the Raiders, of course. And this is a Raiders channel. So that's what's really uh, specific and interesting for the viewers of this channel. And right after Gruden was let go, we predicted, and I think you as well, that the Raiders would probably do really well, and they eventually did make the playoffs. That was the bet we had. You would come back on this show if the Raiders made the playoffs. They did make the playoffs. Now you're here. So what do you think? Do you think the playoffs was a perfect gift for Raiders fans after their head coach was, was let go? Yeah, I do. And I also, I mean, I think it also relates back to the fact that they even became the Las Vegas Raiders and they built a brand new stadium in uh, Las Vegas. Because it's really interesting if you look, and I have a chart of it actually on my website, of all the teams that have, there's not a lot of relocation in the NFL, but in Major League Baseball either. But in Major League Baseball and the NFL, teams that either remodeled, like do significant remodeling, renovations to their stadium, or get brand new stadiums, how often they have success right around there, either just before or just after that stadium is built as if to, you know, say thank you to the city for giving us this free money and free land for building a new stadium or to thank you, you know, for relocating and that sort of thing. And I think in a way that's what Las Vegas got with the Raiders this year. So they got their thank you, you know, you made it. So here you go. Right. And those tickets are very expensive. Like when you looked at all the ticket prices around the NFL, like the top five most expensive games for them are Raiders games or something crazy like that. Average oh, ticket really? price I didn't uh, know that. For, for regular season and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I just feel like now uh, things are things have settled with the Gruden thing. Uh, we, we talked about that a little bit. It, it, it was, um, in my opinion, orchestrated by Goodell in the NFL. And not only in my opinion, Gruden is suing the NFL and that's what he claims. He claims Roger Goodell and the NFL had an orchestrated campaign to take him out. Uh, how much validity do you think there is to Gruden's claim? And do you think his lawsuit will pan out? They're, they're going to have a hearing February 23rd, whether or not the judge will throw it out in Nevada. Well, it's funny. First of all, nobody talks about it, right? I mean, it was a big ordeal. Like we talked apparently in October. I didn't remember when it was. but mm. And now does anybody mention Gruden or the emails or any of that? I mean, it's ancient history right it's right. like been buried in this very real way by the nfl but i think it you know given the fact that there were only what like six emails released they all related to gruden and all related to you know supposedly his racism out of 400 some odd thousand emails that were available it seems very targeted i mean <laughs> how can you how can you argue that when right. considering all the emails that were possible i mean that's insane so yeah i think it was targeted gruden the real question is why yeah. I mean, why John Gruden? Why, you know, he wasn't, a, I mean, he worked for ESPN, but he wasn't really working for the NFL at the time, even though they were covering Monday Night Football. So why Gruden? I mean, that's yeah. really the question. And I really don't think if it does, you know, as the lawsuit advances, I'm sure there'll be a settlement and nothing will ever go to court because if they go to court, then they're going to have to produce all the emails. And obviously the NFL doesn't want that to happen. Right. They don't want that to happen. And if you go to court, you can have people testify like like what if Mark yeah. Davis, you know, the owner of the Raiders with his little haircut testifies <laughs> in court. It would be yeah. great. It would be great ratings for TV, I think, if it does. But it does seem like it will just eventually get thrown out. It does feel like ancient history. Nobody talks about it. And you do wonder why. And, and that's one thing that I think maybe we'll never know. We'll never know it. Maybe, maybe deep into the future, we'll figure this out. Uh, we'll, we'll see why I heard there were some comments that Gruden made about Goodell and maybe this was personal, a personal vendetta, but that seems, uh, it, what trips me out the most is it, it seems like there's only a small pool of people in, in the world who are allowed to become NFL head coaches. And it seems like they always cycle through the same ones. Like some guy will get fired and then he'll come back. Even Jay Gruden, Gruden's brother was interviewing for some coordinator positions and stuff. So it's like, could it, 
if you're already allowed in the club, the club with all the, all the rich coaches, all the elite people, what would you have to do to get kicked out of that club? Is saying offensive things about Roger Goodell enough to get kicked out of that elite club, in your opinion? You wouldn't think so. I mean, you really wouldn't. I mean, I'm sure plenty of people have said bad things about Roger Goodell within the NFL. And, I mean, even though it's through these e- emails, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what you have to do. Because you're right, there is a real closed click of coaches and you always see because they always talk about the coaching trees and how these people developed out of the said coach and whatnot and there's a lot of nepotism because there's a lot of sons of former coaches who are now coaching in the league and former players who are coaching in the league and you're right it is a very closed close-knit circle apparently of people and it's really interesting like you say how do you get in and then how do you manage to get yourself kicked out and like (laughs) royally kicked out the way john gruden did i mean it's it's really interesting because, like I say, I have a feeling we'll never know. We'll never know. I have and a feeling it's going to go away. It seems like he makes the NFL more money, too. Like, like people, everybody knows Gruden. Like, more people, I think, know who John Gruden is, like average people who don't watch football, than, like, Andy Reid. You know, I, I really do think so because yeah. he's a character. He's impersonated by Frank Caliendo and stuff. So he really must have did something or someone <laughs> really must have hated this guy. But anyways, we have Josh McDaniels. Moving on to become the Raiders' new head coach from the Patriots, and it is kind of convenient though. This this coach Gruden gets canceled, you know, gets gets taken out through a hit job, and then of course the Patriots and their staff are coming in to Vegas and taking over. Josh McDaniels, do you think he will bring Spygate with him to to the Raiders? Do you think so? Well, he brought it to Denver, right? I mean. <laughs> Uh, that's the that's you know that's the exact thing so this guy you know the patriots cheated let's say even mcdaniels wasn't even involved but i mean they we know legitimately spygate was something right they never really delved into totally what it was but it was clearly something and it was something that was very nefarious and so then mcdaniels goes to denver and apparently whether he was involved in the spygate in new england who knows but he does the exact same thing in denver yeah and he gets busted for it and <laughs> And now they're just, you know, first of all, the Patriots welcoming him right back after he gets kicked out of Denver after losing, you know, like no harm, no foul, I guess. And now again, now he's Raiders head coach. Well, why do you want a cheater? Right. Right. I mean, he's a proven cheater. I mean, we can't, <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. And yeah. Yet, there he is. There's the guy you bring in. Yeah, of all the people in the world you could have potentially used as a head coach, you went after the guy who was basically busted twice for cheating and filming his opponents. Right. Yeah. And I guess that's just the way it goes. Like we said, there's some people allowed in this clique of elite coaches. He's someone who's allowed and you can even get caught, you know, even Bill Belichick, you get caught. Right. And you can still persist. Some people aren't allowed either way, though. I still I mean, I'm a Raiders fan. You, you've convinced me that, there, you know, there's fixing in the NFL. I know it's compromised. But I still watch football and I get I get sort of motivated by the rigging now. So we had the we had the Buccaneers win the Super Bowl when Tampa Bay hosted it. We have the Rams win the Super Bowl when LA is hosting it. This upcoming year, I believe Arizona is hosting it. So who knows? Will the Cardinals win the Super Bowl? And will the Raiders win the Super Bowl when they're hosting it in 2024? Is is this really how it's going to be from now on? God, I hope not. <laughs> I hope it's not. I mean, it's, but you're right. I mean, how does that happen twice in a row? That's pretty bizarre. But it's, I mean, I shouldn't predict it, but I, I can't see it happen three or four times in a row. That's that would just be cliche after a certain point in time. But I think, you know, with the one with the rate with the Rams just this year, I mean, think about what the Rams ownership went through that they relocated the team willingly from St. Louis broke their lease cost them what almost a billion dollars now due to the lawsuit resulting from that move, moved to Los Angeles where the NFL apparently didn't need a team for 20 years, but now desperately needed a team there. So they built the $5 billion stadium at their own cost. Yeah, and then relocated the Rams, and now suddenly, geez, here you go, owner. Here's the world championship to help you <laughs> build up that fan base. Isn't that convenient? Yeah, and we're supposed to believe that's just coincidence. That right? Just, oops, that accidentally happened to the NFL's benefit. Isn't that great? But it's becoming wow. weird because you've written about this on your website, you know, fixesin.net, and you, you you've talked about and you even mentioned it a little earlier which is when when you got renovations to stadiums you're going to see success for certain teams and i used to feel like that was real and, and and i would see those trends with certain teams being successful but now it's hosting like like just hosting you don't even got to make renovations anymore you just host and do you think fans will uh, what i really want to ask is do you think nfl fans football fans are 
I guess, naive enough to fall for it. Like, can the NFL, they've already done it two years in a row. Can they really do it four years in a row? I'm a Raiders fan. I want them to do it four years in a row. <laughs> will, will fans still watch? Oh, wouldn't you just be happier if the Raiders made it to the Super Bowl next year in Arizona and you don't have to worry about that home one? Oh, yeah. Then it would be, yeah. That wouldn't be such a big deal. Yeah. Um, but, no, I think fans, unfortunately, you know, because it is entertainment and because it is an escape from everyday worries and problems and that sort of thing, right. I think a lot of fans, for lack of a better term, turn their brains off when they watch football or basketball or whatever sport it is they enjoy. And because it's entertainment and you don't want to think you just want to enjoy what happens and feel the emotions of the wins and the losses, the great plays and that sort of thing. Right. So after the game's over, then you kind of forget about it unless there's a bad call that you dwell over or bad play that you dwell over. But for the most part, you forget about it and you move on until the next game. So I think fans will basically fall for it. Yeah. I mean, I think they're somewhat addicted to sports and I think at the same time that they want the escapism and they don't want to, consider what's really at stake because you know the nfl is a multi-billion dollar industry and i don't believe you leave a multi-billion dollar industry up to chance i just don't right and you've said that you you ruin the game for certain people i feel like um it's like if there's a really attractive woman that you see and then uh there's someone and then the person pointing out well you got all this makeup on and all this stuff on and that's why i feel like that's sort of what you do with the game for some people but it's good it's insightful and I mean, it makes sense when you look at the playoffs, the playoffs this year, you've written about this on your, on your website. H has there ever been a playoff? I mean, a year like this where every playoff game is just comes down to the wire, comes down absolutely to the wire. And I think the, the ratings have been higher than they have in over 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I can't, although well, it's interesting because wild card weekend was terrible. There was four blowouts pretty much. If right. I remember right. But then the next seven games all literally came down to the final player, the final drive. And I don't think that's ever happened yeah. in NFL history. But it isn't it great for television? Isn't it great for people watching at home? Especially oh, when you had like that Bills Chiefs game that was insane at the end. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. But yeah, how many times can it come down to the final play, the final drive? And it happened time and time again, especially the entire NFL season. I think someone supposedly uh, sent me a tweet and said something like 43% of NFL games came down to the final drive or final play. Wow, that's, I mean, insane. that's insane. I mean, that's NBA basketball stuff. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's really because really, you know, NBA, you could just tune into the final two minutes to see what really happens. And that's what the NFL became. Yeah. You didn't really have to watch the game until it basically it hit the two minute warning to see what was going to happen. And it's never like that in the NFL. I mean, just by happenstance, supposedly, if this is all coincidence, there should have been more blowouts. There should have been, especially in the playoffs and especially in the Super Bowl. And we haven't had really a blowout Super Bowl in how many years? Oh, it's been so it's long. Funny, probably since the Raiders lost to the Buccaneers. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, that's, really, that, honestly, that, really, that's that's. Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> but I think that game was fixed anyway. Right for Gruden. I mean, I mean, yeah. we, and that's a good thing to talk about because Tim Brown has said that Bill Callahan he he thought through the game. Jerry yeah, Rice God. said he agreed with him, but like. The devil's advocate is like advocate in me is like why would Bill Callahan help John Gruden? Like, it, it doesn't make sense to me in that way. Well, and I don't know that if he game. was helping John Gruden necessarily. He might have been just hurting the Raiders. He might have just been hurting the organization. Mm, yeah, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean he was helping Gruden, but he might have been hurting. And I remember I had heard somewhere an explanation why Callahan would have do it, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Right. But at the same time, why would Jerry Rice and Tim Brown, who are I mean both Hall of Fame wide receivers, why would they come out and say that if it wasn't true? I mean, why would they make that? And that's the interesting thing. You know, it's funny because people always say to me, you know, if games were fixed and players were involved, wouldn't they talk about it? Well, here you had two Hall of Famers, especially Jerry Rice is very well respected. And I'm sure Tim Brown is too. And they both came out and said that. What did the media say? Well, these guys are nuts. <laughs> yeah. There's no way that was true. Well, so why would some player come out and say a game was fixed if that's the reaction you're going to get? Right. And these are, you know, respectable guys. They're not just some, you know, backup quarterback or something like that. They're well-respected players. And they came out and said, our coach sabotaged our chances at winning the Super Bowl. And on the flip side, at the same time, you know, John Gruden knew everything that the Raiders were going to do because he was talking to Rich Gannon the entire season up to the week of the Super Bowl. And right. basically Gannon was telling them, hey, we haven't changed the audibles. We haven't changed this in the offense. We haven't changed that. So Gruden in practice for the Super Bowl was pretending to be Gannon and explained it to his defense. Look, when he says this or he does this, this is what they're going to run. This is what they're going to do. And he was right. He was absolutely 100% right. So, I mean, 
in many ways, as far as I'm concerned, that game was completely fixed from top to bottom. And you also have, I believe his name's DJ Williams. I, I, I may be blanking on his name, but he's a Buccaneers linebacker. There's some radio clip you could find on YouTube where he, oh, yeah. he says he believes that game is fixed and, and, a, and a lot of the game is fixed, huh? I don't think it was that game. Oh, oh I, wait, maybe it was that game. I well, he was just, he was talking was about like... He was talking about last year's Buccaneers Super Bowl. But yeah, he had played in the other one. Yeah, and right. he, he said that same thing. Like, we knew all their plays, you know what I mean? Like, so it is, it, it is a little sketch in that way. And so... Individuals throwing games. I was checking out your website, Patrick Mahomes. You know, I'm a Raiders fan. I love taking any opportunity to say negative things about Patrick Mahomes. You know, I, I really take advantage of that when I can. And I'm going to admit, just like you, I was a little surprised with how the second half of the game went against the Bengals. And, and you, you written, you've written about this. Do you think Patrick Mahomes tanked and fixed and threw that game against the Bengals? I think it's a possibility. I mean, now, can I prove it? No, of course right. not. I mean, otherwise it would be a big to-do about it all. But, I mean, I think if you look at the way he played, you know, most of the season, actually, he had kind of a funky season as it was. But, I mean, especially in the second half of that game, they were rolling in the first half, and then they had that stupid play right at the end of the first half that cost them at least three points by not kicking a field goal. And then they just fell flat on their face. It's like he forgot he had Travis Kelsey. He forgot he had to re-kill. And he was throwing passes willy-nilly. And even at the very end, when they still had a chance to – was it win with the touchdown right there at the very end, or at least tie with the touchdown? Oh, it was win with the touchdown. Right. You know, there was a couple times he was just standing back there looking at his wide receivers and he wouldn't throw the ball. And then he kind of got halfway accidentally sacked and just kind of like dropped the ball on the ground. Right. I mean, it wasn't like a legit fumble, but it was a fumble. I mean, it was it was really strange what he did. And oh, like yeah. I say, it, I mean, it, maybe he tanked it, but you know, I can't prove it. But it, I mean, I think if you watch it, it's interesting for sure. Definitely. And, and, you know, I, I would like to jump at the, you know, jump at the gun to say, oh, he's overrated. You know, you know, he didn't have to tank it because he's so bad. But, you know, I, I was surprised. I was like, man, this guy's just going backwards. He's getting sacked. And who knows? He is a well compensated man. Right. I think he has the largest sure. contract in the NFL. If anybody was going to fix it, it would be somebody like him. Right. Well, and you know, and it's one of those things where you know, I have talked in the past about like Peyton Manning potentially being kind of like an NFL company man that, you know, Peyton Manning it was basically kind of told like, look, you do X for us. We'll do Y for you. And, you know, he had some failures in the playoffs. He had some failures in the Super Bowl. Yet he won two Super Bowls, especially the way he went out in Denver with the Super Bowl 50 and, you know, the big, you know, farewell retirement thing that they did for him. Who's to say Patrick Mahomes isn't in that same boat. He won a That's Super right. Bowl right away. And then potentially, Hey, you got to do X, Y, and Z to repay us for that. And maybe down the line, we'll repay you again. I mean, who's to say that that kind of quid pro quo doesn't exist in the NFL? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be surprising. I mean, hey, you got to tank this year to uh, or tank this game to boost up Burrow, the new, the, the another, the new exactly. darling, the new young guy, right? Yeah, and that was yeah, the one because thing... I mean, where Patrick Mahomes, he's not losing endorsement deals from that loss. You know, oh, he's yeah. not losing contract money from that loss. I mean, he's he's making plenty of money doing what he's doing, and he's really, I mean, his 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 luster really fallen off from losing those the Super Bowl in this game? No. Yeah. So, I mean, people still think of him as elite quarterback, and he's probably got at least 10 more years in the league as long as he just stays healthy. So, again, if he's a that company type of guy that may exist in the NFL that they say, hey, you do X, we'll give you Y, maybe that's exactly what happened. I mean, again, I can't prove it. Right. But I think it's something, you know, you can legitimately question and think about because, again, this is a giant business and it's entertainment. And – well, I mean, that's one thing, though, where, where sometimes it feels like, OK, yeah, I get it. They're going to take care of the company guys, the guy, the guys who've, you know, who've done what they wanted him to do. You know, we, we could say that with fixing games or whatever. But Tom Brady, I mean, I was really surprised that he didn't go out with a bang. He kind of just drifted away into the night. Were you surprised by that? Somebody who clearly seems like they have benefited from the NFL's officiating at, at the very least throughout his career. Well, yeah, he did. But no, I, it didn't totally surprise me because I don't think you can send a guy like Brady out the same way you sent Manning out, especially since you just sent Manning away, what, six years ago in that same fashion. I mean, had Brady retired after last year's Super Bowl without announcing that he was basically done after this game, you know, it wouldn't have been the same to do type of send off that Manning was, but it would have been a good, you know, he won his final Super Bowl and I leave fine. You know, you could kind of stomach that, but if they had the hold to do like, Oh, it's Tom Brady's last hurrah and blah, blah, blah. I think fans would have been rolling their eyes at it. A little so too think, obvious. Yeah, 
expecting for him to go out this way. I mean, he had a dramatic comeback, another 27 to 3 comeback, right, in the playoffs. They right. kind of mirrored the Super Bowl win against the Falcons. You know, maybe that was kind of their way of sending him away. I mean, because you can't, not everybody can go out on top. And Brady's had plenty of being on top. <laughs> so, you know, maybe they're just like, or he was even just like, oh, you know what? I'm legitimately done with this. I'm done. I'm walking away. Right. It, it, it would maybe look a, a little too obvious. Um, yeah. One former teammate of, of Brady uh, had a lot of things to say that I thought uh, were, were pretty controversial and, and not too crazy, uh, unlike his usual behavior. I'm talking about Antonio Brown. So Antonio Brown, we saw the shirtless fiasco mid-year with, with Tom Brady and then even making some comments about Tom Brady and and uh, Bruce Arians, head coach of the Buccaneers. So his grievance, right, is is he claims – Bruce Arians, head coach of the Buccaneers, was trying to force him to play hurt, right? And then when he yeah. wouldn't play hurt, he got cut. And then it, to me, what, what's so striking, uh, let, let me just ask this. Do you think the whole media is trying to make Antonio Brown look crazy because of his injury grievance with the Buccaneers? I think Antonio Brown is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I think he's crazy, but... Yeah, I, mean, I think he's he's not right. I mean, he's not right, but don't... like. I just think it's odd where if you watch like these NFL talk shows and media, it's everybody's unanimously not hearing out his, his injury grievance. Like, like the fact that Bruce Arians is trying, was trying to get him to pay, play injured. And then he said he got a shot at toward it all too, before the game. Yeah, no, I think you're right though. On that aspect is that it is interesting that the media a lot of times lines up lockstep behind kind of the main story line in this situation. And you know, you're right. Nobody really seemed to take Antonio Brown's side. Now, of course it's, kind of hard to question how injured he was when he's jumping up and down, you know, without a shirt on in the end zone <laughs> as he leaves the field. It makes you kind of wonder what was going on. But, you know, in other cases, I mean, my favorite was like Tim Donahue. So Tim Donahue, you know, was one of the most well-respected NBA refs until he got busted by the FBI. And so as soon as he became a criminal, then it was always criminal Tim Donahue claims this and he's nuts. You know, there's no way he was doing this. There's no way the NBA was doing that because we can't trust this criminal and what he's saying. Right. And that's kind of like the same thing with Antonio Brown. You just can't trust what he's saying because the guy's nuts or the guy, you know, isn't a team player or whatever it is. But you rarely really hear competing sides unless they want to let, you know, Shannon skip, you know, yell at each other for no good reason. Right. Uh, but for the most part, they always line up together against certain narratives or against certain players or certain coaches or whatever. It's just because that almost seems to be the mandated, you know, story you have to stick to. And it, it, it's interesting too, like when you get into discussions about injuries and how Antonio Brown is, uh, mentioned uh, taking the tort at all. Uh, people have talked about how common that could be in the NFL. Oh, it's extremely um, common. It, it's extremely common. And uh, how common do you think something like that is? And, and, and is there a certain aspect in the NFL where? NFL where fans are not allowed to see how the sausage is made and, and would fans watch it if you think they saw how the sausage was actually made? Uh, oh, NFL. well, I mean, in regards to drug usage, I mean, if you go back and read some of the older like uh, biographies and stuff by former players and look at what they did in the seventies and eighties, I mean, they talked about back then how there would literally be fish bowls filled of like amphetamines and painkillers and what have you. And the players could just reach and grab and throw them down and, you know, walk out and go play. I mean, you know, there's famous book, North Dallas 40 talks a lot about how bad the, you know, drugs were and how much, you know, the doctors were shooting them up and that sort of thing to get him to go play. And I don't think that's changed one bit. Mm. I mean, I think it's really bad, but again, you know, part of it's the player who says, if I don't play this week, I get replaced. And if the guy who replaces me does better than me, I may be permanently be replaced then I got to get out there and play and do my job. So shoot me up, give me this, whatever, I'll go do it. And I think, like you say, that sort of stuff happens all the time and it gets totally washed over, whitewashed over. And that's why you see these, you know, NFL players 10 years after they're done playing, and some of them can barely walk, they can barely move their hands. I mean, they're messed up from this game. And part of it is from the physicality of it, but also I think it's from the drug usage because they're playing injured and, you know, it's dumb so they don't feel it. So they just keep destroying it until it's inoperable yeah 
No, it's really intense. And I think uh, yeah, despite the fact that Antonio Brown is crazy, some of these claims about, you know, being forced to play injured, taking shots toward it all, it's true. I mean, it just seems like it's true. You, you, you know, you've, you're, you've talked about it a lot. Uh, one thing that is really interesting uh, lately is this Brian Flores lawsuit. Uh, Roger, and in particular, Roger Goodell's reaction to it. it like, we talked about the NFL media kind of going they typically all agree and have the same narrative their, their opinion about Antonio Brown and the injury grievance is the same and also their opinion about Brian Flores's claim that the NFL racially discriminates when hiring head coaches the whole NFL media seems to agree with him are, are you a little shocked that the NFL media is sort of supporting this guy Brian Flores suing them <laughs> well I think they're supporting the racism claims right more than anything and i think you know i'm gonna i don't want to sound like a racist <laughs> you know, <laughs> very delicate thing here but i think they kind of have to support those claims i don't think they can really just dismiss them right because then like you know like me saying you know then you kind of get dubbed the racist if you say oh you know that coach is crazy for saying those sort of things well that's because you're a white guy and you haven't experienced it and blah 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 and I understand that. You know, I haven't been in his shoes. I don't know what it's like. Right. But I think, like you said, I think the media has to kind of agree with him on those cases. But it's funny, the game fixing part of it, the tanking for a hundred thousand dollars game part, well, that's gone. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, the whole argument is gone. And it's funny because you know, I was pointed out on Twitter right away. I'm like, look, that's a federal crime. Yeah. That, what tanking. He's talking about well, not tanking, but saying the owner offered me $100,000 to lose a game, that is the federal law called the Split Bribery Act to a T, which says you cannot bribe a player, a coach, or a referee to alter the outcome of a game. Well, a $100,000 bonus is essentially a bribe, right? Right. Because you don't want to lose. That's not your goal as the coach. Your goal is to win. So if they're giving you hundred grand to lose a game, basically both of them at that point then are breaking that law, and the FBI should be investigating and these guys should be under arrest. And the same goes for Hugh Jackson and the Browns, who said the exact same thing. He said, oh, yeah, they did that for me, too. They offered me a bonus. And I went 1-31 and 31 in my two years as the Browns head coach. Well, those guys should all be under arrest. Yeah. But that team has been white, gone. So we can talk about the racism thing. That's fine. But don't bring up this, you know, federal offense thing that nobody realized I think was a crime. That, which I think is really funny because I really don't think his lawyers understood it. I don't think he understood it. I don't think Hugh Jackson understood it. I don't think anybody understood that part of it. But the, as soon as it happened, I have a friend of mine who was a, uh, a law professor, sports law professor down in Florida, and he texted me right away, and all his text was the Force Bribery Act because he knew exactly <laughs> what I was doing. He said the same thing. They basically admitted to a federal crime. Right. No. Yeah. So that was really crazy. And then, and it also makes you think like, how often does this happen? Like if you got two people admitting it, former head coaches, like we said earlier, it's an elite club to really be a head coach. It, it's a small group of people who get these opportunities. That's, that's a, I mean, it makes you think this probably happens a lot more often. And then people are gambling on these games. People are investing money and then, you know, they're well, taking and, and that's the thing is, you know, nobody, again, when this all happened with uh, Flores and the Dolphins saying that, you know, they, offered me $100,000 to lose each game. Nobody's connected it to the NBA, where we know game tanking is rampant, rampant in the NBA. I mean, you had, you know, Mark Cuban went on the Dan Patrick show and said, I took my whole team out to dinner and told them it's in our best interest to lose. Wow. But nobody made the connection between the, you know, the NBA thing and the NFL thing or that it happens or that maybe people are getting paid under the table to intentionally lose games because why is the head coach, would you go out and have a to totally losing record if you were getting, you know, incentivized in some way, shape, or form. But again, that's a federal crime. Right. And if, if they're not being incentivized to do that, at the same time, then it really relates to what I talk about is the fact that these games can and are being manipulated by the owners of the leagues because who's tanking the game? It's not the coach and the players, really. I mean, they're physically doing it, but it's not their idea to do it. Right. So it's coming from the GM or it's coming from the ownership that's basically forcing these guys to go out there and underperform, and they're willingly doing it. So right. again, you're, which games matter, which games don't matter? Could you do that in the playoffs? Could you do that in the finals? I mean, if if you can do it in one place, you can do it in all the places. And how often is it happening? And who's being paid to do it? And um, it seems like the the owners are going to make their money, even if they don't win. Even if the team doesn't win, the owners are going to make the money. It seems like the oh. players have less of, a, of an incentive because you're you're hurting your record, your stats. 
stuff like that, yeah. right? But again, if maybe, as Flores maybe pointed out, well, maybe they're incentivized by money. Right. But again, that's the federal crime part of it. But, you know, maybe that's been going on for decades and nobody's known about it. Because I'm sure, you know, there's been other NFL teams where, you know, it's getting toward the end of the season and, you know, we got a chance to maybe be the number five overall draft pick or maybe the number two overall draft pick. You know, if we just lose two out of these next three games, we can really improve potentially our draft position. Well, maybe we should do that. Yeah. <laughs> and again, it's going to affect the players. It's going to affect the coach, but it's not affecting the ownership whatsoever. So oh. maybe if he says, look, I throw you guys a little bone, you go out and do what I want you to do. It helps the team. Yeah, some of you guys may be cut. Maybe the head coach should lose your job. But, you know, let's all make out on this. Yeah. Let's get some money, right? And that's yeah. the thing. Money, I feel like, uh, is is just invading the NFL uh, at a higher degree because of just legalized gambling. Like, never in my life did I expect that you could just legally gamble like this, you know, uh, on your phone and whatnot. And how how much of an impact has that either already or do you think that's going to have on the game? The fact that gambling is just straight up legal at this point. I honestly don't think it matters. You don't think it matters Which either it, way? No, because I think it was there was so much illegal gambling going on that now it's actually just above the board. I mean, I think that's the only difference is, you know, you can see it, you can do it you know, on an app on your phone, but before, you know, you could do it by calling your bookie or going to your local bar where the bookie hang, hung out or whatever. I mean, you know, they estimated that there was potentially upwards of, I forget what the number was, it was like $450 billion wagered illegally on sports in the United States every year. Wow. I mean, Four hundred fifty billion dollars is an insane amount of money. <laughs> but that's what they estimated was being wagered illegally on sports just in this country. Yeah. And now that we've seen legalized sports gambling, you know, and you've seen every all the numbers above the board, that estimate probably wasn't too too far off the mark. Right. Because you know, there's you know, I think what it was, New York just already had a billion dollars wagered on sports, and they just legalized sports gambling like a month or so ago. And it's so hard for them to quantify the, um, you know, underground market. So it's probably a lot larger. You know, it's, it's only what they do know of the underground market. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a guesstimate. But I mean, even if it was a hundred billion, you know, a hundred billion dollars is more than the NFL, NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball make combined. Four <laughs> times as much is what they make combined. And people don't think that sort of money has an influence on the game or could have the an influence on the game. Well, of course it can. I mean, and that's the thing is, you know, they've busted up over the years some pretty heavy duty sports gambling rings in Texas and other places where they were taking like $5 million in bets a week. Well, right. if somebody's going to fix a game, you're not going to go to Caesar's palace and bet on the game you fixed. You're going to go to some underground bookie who's taken that kind of money and you're going to put your money through that guy where it won't be recognized. Or maybe that guy's in on it and he spreads it around the United States, which some of these guys do. And it's just going to be filtered through all these things and nobody's ever going to see it. But that's where you're going to fix the game. And even though they've legalized sports gambling in, what, like 30 states now, I think, you know, again, you're not going to bet through those outlets if you're fixing the game because they won't even handle, like, $1,000 bets because it's so corporate. Mm -hmm. You have to be a special person to really get your that kind of money bet on certain games. So you're still going to have a black market. It's still going to exist and still does exist to handle these heavy-duty bets. And those are the guys who are potentially, you know, organized crime members, those guys are professional gamblers, and those are the guys who might want to get the players to get to fix games for gambling purposes. Right. Yeah, and so as far as fixing games, yeah, it, I guess it wouldn't be new if, like you're saying, the underground market has already existed. Uh, people can fix games for the for those gamblers. But, I, I mean... Well, because, I mean, think about it. I mean, like with Las Vegas, you know, if you were a heavy-duty gambler in living in Texas, for example, you know, if... You could fly to Vegas for the weekend if you want to bet on an NFL game, right? Right. I mean, how hard would that be? Or have somebody fly there for you or whatever. But those guys weren't doing it. They were betting through some bookie in Texas because it was easier and it was a better deal basically for them because they'd have to go through the rigmarole. They'd have to pay taxes if they won on a million-dollar bet. All these other things that go along with it. Right. So, again, the underground market's not going to go away. It's never going to go away unless the corporate bookies are willing to bet those huge books or make those huge bets. But they're not because they're corporate. They're not going to do that sort of thing. Yeah. And the gamblers aren't going to want to have to pay the tax on the winnings. So it's never going to go away. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I guess it's interesting. Like, why has, how, why has it taken this long for gambling to become legal uh, for the NFL? Well, it just seems. 
the crazy law that got passed. You know, the, it was called Passed by the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, which was passed, I think, in 1992, which made it illegal for every other state to legalize sports gambling like there was in Nevada. Mm. And New Jersey had the chance to do it, and they screwed it up to legalize it, and they never did. And so then this law existed that prevented states from doing it. So finally, just was a, like five, six years ago now, uh, they finally challenged it. It went to the Supreme Court. And that law got overturned as being unconstitutional, which kind of everybody knew at the time, but nobody cared because the NFL and all the sports were backing it because, you know, legalized gambling affected supposedly their integrity. You right. know, illegal gambling didn't affect their integrity. You know, fancy football didn't affect their integrity, but legalized sports gambling would affect their integrity now because it's legal. Now the <laughs> profit. You know, I just, I think my brother just told me, I think it's the new uh, stadium, was it in Washington, D.C.? Uh, like their hockey and basketball arena, you have to enter the stadium through the sports book. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've heard there's a lot of that happening, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it went from being this dramatic thing, the thing that's going to kill our integrity, a thing we can't have happen to, hey, the only way to enter the stadium is through the sports book. Come on. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, you know, I had argued this like 10 years ago. I'd go, they're against gambling until somebody legally challenges it and that they realize a way to make a profit from it. Then gambling... You know, it's the greatest thing ever. And now it's here, and now it's all over TV and everywhere. We'll see what happens, though, with the NFL. I mean, I'm still going to watch it. Uh, a lot of my viewers, too, I mean, they still watch the game. They, they heard heard your interview, thought you had a lot of good insights, and and you do. And, and hopefully, maybe... Through your uh, through your insights from uh, from how the on how the game's rigged, we can maybe gamble and guess that maybe Burrow is going to go and win the Super Bowl next year. Maybe Arizona, maybe that could help out. Honestly, I like Justin Herbert. I like the Chargers. You think you think they're going to be hot next? Yeah, because he's 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 another type of quarterback that they can build around. And wouldn't it be great again if you want to get conspiratorial here about the Rams winning? Wouldn't it be great to have the other LA team? make the Super Bowl. If you're really going to build up the fan base, the football fan base in Southern California and Los Angeles, okay, now you had the Rams. Now you need the Chargers because you got both teams playing right there in LA. Wouldn't that be uh that makes that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to see that, but that does make sense because even though they're they're helping the Rams out, they still don't seem that popular in LA for, from what I've heard. It, it's kind of weird. Nobody cared about football in LA for 50 years. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why it's gonna change, but at the same time nothing builds you know, a fan base like winning. Right. I mean, I always talk about, you know, like the NHL, like when the Hartford Whalers, they were, you know, little kind of rinky dink team, but they're beloved. They moved to Carolina, they became the Carolina Hurricanes. And wow, instantly they won the Stanley Cup. They never sniffed it when they were in Hartford, but once they relocated and they needed hockey fans down there in the Carolinas, hey, here's a Stanley Cup. And everybody's <laughs> like, oh my God, you know, we're Hurricane fans. Same thing. They took the Nordiques out of Quebec and they moved down to Colorado. They became and hey, they won the Stanley Cup. Wasn't that nice? And they built the whole fan base into that. So I think that's what the you know the NFL is doing with the Rams, and that's why I think the Chargers are a year or two away from being in the Super Bowl themselves. Yeah, that could totally be true. Maybe Joe Burrow uh, are, are already got what he needed, and football is popular in Cincinnati. So now it's time to help out Justin Herbert. Who knows? Yeah. But I appreciate you coming on the show. Everybody, really check out thefixesin.net. Check out your blog, especially on the NFL. You have that page there. It's really yep. cool just seeing um, the collection of information that you share every week. You always have cool tweets and even are able to show plays, too, via Twitter and stuff like that. And it's just really cool seeing it all organized there week by week. And one thing that I like to do on your website is, like, even go back to last year. Like, I even checked out last year because I didn't get to see it. And you can go through and see week by week some of your insights on on what happened and whatnot. And I think it's really interesting. Well, thank you, Brian, though, for going, coming no on. Appreciate, appreciate you stepping by. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.